My name is Mark Karen. I'm a master's student at the University of North Carolina Greensboro uh, in the Peace and Conflict Studies Department. I'm also a facilitator for Working Group 2 in the Student Voices for Refugees Network. Working Group 2 is working on um, the scholarship portion of our project. And I'm here today with a couple of representatives from WASC that I would like um, for them to introduce themselves. Michelle, would you like to lead us off? Sure. My name is Michelle Manx. I'm the Senior Manager for Durable Solutions for Refugees at the World University Service of Canada, which is also known as WUSC globally. Um, we're an international development organization, and we work in education, economic opportunities, and empowerment for young people. Um, and I'm talking about the Student Refugee Program today. Um, so Nora's here to help me do that. Uh, I'm Nur Musa, I'm a global development student at Huron University. Also, I'm the president of the local committee of WASC at Huron University. Also, um, uh, I'm a SRP alumni myself. Great, thanks. Uh, just to kind of give you an overview and those who will view the video of what we're trying to do and what, who we are at Student Voices of Refugees, we're a collaboration of students and professionals working to create accessible and inclusive higher education environment for students from populations affected by forced migration. Uh, our goal during this school year, 2021, is to launch a public education campaign to help US universities expand education pathways for displaced students. Our research is focused on two areas, mentorship and scholarship. My working group specifically is involved in the scholarship research, and we plan to publish an evidence-based toolkit on World Refugee Day on June 20th that will provide a foundation to Im implement best practices for US colleges and universities. Um, and so let's start off right at the beginning, Michelle, if you would, to give us a general overview of World University Service of Canada, including a historical perspective, your mission and values. Sure. Yeah. So um, as I mentioned, now we're uh, one of the leading international development organizations in Canada, but we actually began as a network of students who um, had wanted to provide an opportunity to displace students to continue their educations after the First and Second World Wars. And it was part of this global network. WUSC uh, in Canada had our first chapter uh, in the 1940s um, and it evolved from there so uh, it grew um, on different campuses it was really a network of student uh, students who were advocating to their universities and supporting um, the sponsorship uh, of refugees um, who were displaced in Europe to come to Canada pursue their education and then stay as permanent residents so um, it is still an important program of our organization today and we still uh, work with uh, Canadian students and post-secondary institutions across the country in this work uh, and it complements some of the other work that we do in refugee education in countries of first asylum um, of, of uh, refugees as well. Just to kind of piggyback on that, can you speak in detail and describe the student refugee program? Yeah, so the, the student refugee program is a youth-led peer-to-peer um, -peer refugee sponsorship program that operates under Canada's immigration infrastructure, which allows us to sponsor refugees as uh, not-for-profit organizations. Um, so it gives us the ability to identify students overseas who are in need of a durable solution and opportunities to continue their education. And um, they come to Canada, they're supported by the students on their campus, a group of students, which Noor can talk about uh, because she's one of the chairs of the local committee um, groups, as we call them. Um, and really their, their role is to ensure that the financial um, support is in place um, to raise funds as needed and then to support the social, academic and financial integration of uh, the refugees that come to Canada as permanent residents. Um, so what that means for us here in Canada is that once you're a permanent resident, um, you have a durable status. Um, so they don't come as international students, they really come as resettled persons in need of protection. Um, and that grants them the right to stay upon graduation and to have access to the same um, same funding opportunities and employment opportunities as any Canadian citizen would have. Um, and the other piece of the work that local committees do, our student groups, is to raise awareness about um, access to refugee education and the realities of forced migrants around the world in the context that we work in, but also more broadly, and to destigmatize um, refugees uh, amongst the Canadian public and, and Canadian campuses. Um, I guess what's one of the unique pieces about our program is that it's also student funded. So I mentioned that the local committees are responsible, the student groups are responsible for funding um, or securing the funding for uh, the sponsorships. And how our program works is that um, almost every camp 
every student on a campus pays into a, what we call a student levy, and then that money goes to support um, the refugee students that come to each campus. Um, and is matched often by the post-secondary institution who offer tuition waivers, um, accommodations waivers, meal plan waivers. Um, it really differs from campus to campus. Nor anything you'd like to add to that, just on a kind of local basis? Uh, like uh, just for the last part, uh, our campus uh, we had like referendum uh, two years ago to increase the uh, the levy fee in our campus, uh, so students are contributing more money for this program. Uh, also, uh, part of how we secure the fund we negotiate with uh, with the administration if they have money and they can contribute as well. Uh, and I know some campuses also they make some like. Uh, fundraising events to collect money for the program. Thank you. Um, so I want to work into kind of who the students are that are part of this program. And so can you talk about the target population, um, what countries the students originate from, and, and specifically how do you connect with these potential candidates? Mm -hmm. Um, so students have come from a number of different countries of origin over time. We've sponsored students from 39 different countries of origin. Um, but we currently recruit students from six countries of asylum. And we have probably about 15 different nationalities within those countries of asylum that are able to access our program. Um, we work, we typically work in quite protracted refugee contexts. And currently we are, are recruiting students from Lebanon and Jordan in the Middle East, um, and then Kenya, Malawi, Tanzania, and Uganda in Sub-Saharan Africa. And so students might come, students who are living in those countries come from um, Congo, so Sudan, Sudan, Eritrea, Ethiopia, um, Syria, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it's important to make that distinction for those who are not as familiar with um, those contexts. And um, we look for young people who are able to study in either English or French, which is the language of instruction here in Canada, um, and who meet a minimum sort of language benchmark, after which we provide them um, additional language training so that they can pass um, the tests that are required for our admissions to, to Canadian institutions. Um, they have to be single without dependents, um, and then they they must meet a minimum academic qualification, depending on which country it is that they are in. So obviously we have different requirements for Jordan and Lebanon because students are presenting documents from Syria or elsewhere than we would from um, you know, Malawi where Congolese students are presenting different documents. So it, it really depends on the country of asylum. Um, and we're looking for students who don't have any other opportunities to have a durable solution in the country of asylum that they're in or um, to continue their study. Anything to add, Noor? You went through the process. Uh, like for the process, maybe I can just talk a little bit about my experience. Uh, I know I knew about uh, the scholarship uh, from friend that worked. Like there was, uh, they published it on social media. I think like mainly on Facebook, and uh, people publish it between each other. Uh, and especially uh, former SRV students, they contribute a lot with the. Uh, communicating this uh, scholarship to other students like uh, in the asylum country where they come from. Great. If, I could, information. Add, if I could add to that, Mark, maybe um, when we first started working in the Middle East um, in the early 2010s, um, we had to work with uh, organ organizations that work with young people or deliver education. Um, it really depends on the country of asylum, who, who are the organizations that work with young people. The idea is to try and make the opportunity known to as many people as possible and to have equitable access um, to the opportunity as much as possible. In contexts like in Kenya, where we've operated for almost 40 years now and where the camps have existed for almost 40 years, young people know about the opportunity as early as primary school. And they are working towards this higher education opportunity at as early as um, you know, upper primary in Kenya. Same thing with Malawi, Tanzania, and Uganda are new contexts. And so we work with the implementing partners in education of the UNHCR in those contexts to help promote um, promote the opportunity and support us in the shortlisting process of student selection. So on a yearly basis, how many students um, are sponsored? How many scholarships are given? And then overall, do you know approximately how many students have benefited from the program? Yep. Um, so currently, 
we sponsor somewhere between 135 and 150 students per year to Canada. We work with about 100 institutions or just over 100 institutions. And that represents, for a Canadian context, almost all of our universities participate in this program. Um, and so our objective is to continue growing the program. Um, and since 1978, we've sponsored now about 2,400 students. So it's really been growing incrementally over the years. And then the last sort of four or five years, we had a really big push to try and grow it. And our objective is to double the program again to 300 students per year. Great. Um, so on your website, um, part of your mission is a resettlement portion. Uh, can you explain the areas in which WASC and the student refugee program help support students with resettlement process? Yeah, so as I mentioned before, we have a system in Canada that allows us to be the official sponsor of the students who have um, refugee status or meet the convention definition of a refugee. Um, so we, um, we would submit an application alongside our campus representatives at each campus to the Canadian government to um, resettle the individuals um, that have been the successful applicants to the program. Then the Canadian immigration will make a final decision on their eligibility for immigration to Canada and um, confirm that they are indeed persons in need of Canada's protection. Um, and um, we'll do all of the screening that's normally involved in a resettlement process. What's different than sort of Canada and the United States is one, this ability to name the ability to, to, to fund and sponsor individuals, but also the, the, the ability to um, De destin students to their final campus communities and they're we're not limited in the communities that they can join so it, it provides um it provides us with the opportunity to to make sure they get to the campuses that they they've been admitted to um and so we work closely with um our canadian missions abroad um to make sure that that uh, our students' cases are being processed in time. We work with the International Organization for Migration, who um, in Canada's context coordinate the transportation of students from their country of asylum to Canada, because this can be a challenge for refugees who don't have passports or who are refugees. They, they may face challenges um, transiting through other countries on their way to Canada. And so um, the, the IOM, the International Organization for Migration, coordinates this piece for us. And they do so so that students can arrive in time for the beginning of their first semester in, in September. Um, and then we also support the students themselves to complete the immigration documents that are required for the package that gets submitted to the Canadian government. Um, did I miss anything, Noor? Is there anything else to add in terms of, of that process? No. Um, what's also, I mean, just maybe just to add finally, what we also benefit from is the ability of students to apply for Canadian citizenship after two, after three or four years of being in Canada because they're permanent residents on arrival, they're able to act to apply for that status. So most of our students have become Canadian student is Canadian citizens since since their arrival in Canada. This might be one that um, can be better explained by Nora, but if you both want to chime in, that's fine. Um, the student refugee program is supported by WASC local committees. Can you explain some of the similarities and differences in the ways each university and the local committee operate and how they support student enrollment? Um, I think the similarity is one of the, like the agreement between WASC and the students who are applying for the scholarship that they will be sponsored for one year. Uh, I think all universities are obligated to provide this sponsorship for one year. Uh, in addition, we like as local committees we provide the students with some kind of a mentorship uh social support uh mental health support uh health uh also academic support uh, uh we try like to to find all the services that they can benefit from in our campus uh this for first year i think uh all universities they provide this uh the differences is usually become after the first year. Uh, some universities maybe opt out the tuitions for SRB students after the first year until they graduate. Uh, some universities have like a special scholarship uh, where they give money yearly for the students. Uh, yeah, like uh, I think this, like the, uh, the difference will be after 
the first year what the university will contribute for SRB students. It's different from one university to another. Also, it depends on how many students the university is uh, like hosting every year. Uh, also, um, how big is the institution? Yeah. Yeah, if I, if I could add, I think different universities structure their program in different ways, both in the structure of the committee itself, but also where it's embedded within the university. So some universities officially embed the program under their international students offices or their international programs offices. And there's a staff person that helps oversee the student group that does most of the work. Um, whereas others might, um, it might fall under a student union because it is the student union or the student association, association that collects the student fees, the student levies. And that's another element that differs from campus to campus is this, the, the fee that students pay. So much larger institutions require smaller levies in order to accumulate the amounts that they need to support a person on their campus. Whereas a, a university like NORS, the students pay something like $20 per person, but another campus might spend 25 cents per person. Um, so those are, those are some of the important differences. Um, uh, no, you kind of touched on the answer to this next question um, and that students are sponsored for one year. So after that one year, how do students continue their studies in Canada, um, especially if the university doesn't sponsor them or doesn't keep that scholarship um, ongoing past that first year? Um. I think this start like maybe before students come to Canada, like during the orientation, uh, students will be aware that they need to be dependent, uh, uh, sorry, independent after the first year. Uh, so most students are prepared that they need to be independent. Uh, since we are like SRB students are permanent residents, they, they are qualified to apply for student loans. So any support for students from the Canadian government, they can get it. Uh, also, uh, students are encouraged to find a part-time job or a summer job, and the local committee is responsible to help them to find this job. Uh, like uh, this is financially. Also, like as I mentioned before, in there's some kind of a mentorship at the first year of their arrival, uh, where also they will be connected with the people maybe from their community, uh, uh, with the, the, the services and the universities. So they like, during the first year, they will be aware of what they can use and where they can get help if they need it. And also I think uh, most universities, and maybe Michelle can correct me for that, uh, we have emergency fund for students. So even after the end of the sponsorship year, uh, if students need any um, any financial support for like really emergent, uh, they can ask for it. That's right. And about 50% of the institutions provide support beyond the first year. But I think what's important for your audience to remember is that um, higher education in Canada is heavily subsidized by the government. So the cost of education is much less than it would be for um, American students studying at American institutions. Um, and we do have a student, a, an accessible student loan program um, that all, as Norm mentioned, that all students have access to. Um, we'll wrap it up with this one and this one's um, both of you want to want to chime in and both of you want to uh, answer this question because you may have different perspectives uh, kind of view this one as important to what we're trying to do here because the difference in the education systems between the US and Canada but if you could just kind of maybe um, touch upon some key recommendations from your program that you could share with us that would help serve our purpose of providing educational opportunities for refugee students here in the United States. I think uh, one of the most important, uh, like, if when, when you reach the point when you're able to bring students, uh, it's important to make them aware of the whole situation, what they can get, what kind of support that they can get, and what they need to find it for themselves. Uh, because many students struggle with this uh, after they arrive. And uh, I know that in the US, maybe the situation will be more complicated for a refugee to come and continue their uh, their education. Um, uh, so I think also it it will be great if you can have like a full 
sponsorship for at least the tuitions uh, that I think it will be a good idea. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's it for me now. I think one of the pieces that's been instrumental to our success is the collaboration be between the post-secondary institutions and the students themselves and that they see it as a, a, a program that they're um, working on collectively. Um, you can go much further with support from the institution than you can just as a student group that's trying to implement something on your own and vice versa. Um, an institution can go a lot further if it has the buy-in of the student body and that the student body um, or student groups are directly involved in supporting the incoming students. One, um, because that we found that peer-to-peer -peer support to be really effective at supporting integration, but also because it deepens the understanding of, in our case, Canadian youth, in your case, American youth, of forced migration issues. It provides direct contacts. It creates this learning opportunity that leads to sort of long-term commitments to refugee and forced displacement issues. So I wouldn't lose sight of that as a real big asset um, to the delivery of these education pathways. Um, I think the other thing, the other advantage that we've had is the ability to leverage services on campus that exist already. So health support services for students, um, the international student support services. There's a lot of infrastructure that exists on a, on, a, on a campus that doesn't always exist within a community or is not always accessible within a community. And so to leverage those as much as, as, much as possible. Um, and then one thing for the American context in particular is connected to what I was saying before about waivers and tuition waivers and the number of years of support. So whereas in Canada, we're able to support a student for one year and they don't end up indebted at the end of their academic career in the same way, um, because they're able to support themselves with a job and with smaller loans and bursaries and scholarships. Um, I would, be, because of the high cost of education in the United States, I would really look at trying to provide four full years of at least academic and tuition relief support, um, unless there's some other way around that. But um, I think that's a concern when we're talking to American institutions uh, and, and refugee advocates in the United States, that's one of the biggest concerns that they highlight. Um, and to an institution, a waiver does not cost anything. It's just an extra person in a seat in a classroom. Um, so it's easier for an institution to waive that over four years. And then, sorry, one last thing is around um, the awareness raising component. So I mentioned that um, our student groups are really involved in raising awareness and changing um, trying to change the mindsets um, so that we can create more welcoming campuses and communities. And I think that's an important component in trying to generate support for initiatives like this um, and uh, to have more welcoming campuses and communities more broadly. And I will leave it there. Uh, great, thanks. Um, if you've got a couple more minutes and let me know if you don't, there's a question in the chat, and then I just had one follow-up question, uh, if you guys don't mind answering maybe two more questions. Uh, the chat question is, do local committees slash colleges or college students ever play a role in engaging K through 12 students who are in protracted situations, first countries of asylum? Uh, in other words, recruiting, tutoring, spreading awareness about WASC? Uh, to be honest, I'm not sure if we have something like this as local committee, but I know that we have something like this as SRB alumni. Um, every year, like when they, with the scholarship open, most of us are real alumni, uh, they post it on their Facebook page. Uh, they try to recruit everybody they know or like friends of their friends, and they help people with the application, how to fill it, what papers they need to have uh, to explain the like the conditions of the scholarship. Um, I'm not sure if we have something really more organized as local committee, but I know that it exists from SRB alumni themselves. I, I would say that's true probably for the other contexts as well in Sub-Saharan Africa. Our students um, have about somewhere between 12 and 18 months of preparation before they come to Canada. So they know they've been selected and then they are going through the paperwork and the language instruction and the language testing, et cetera. And during that time, often those students um, become tutors of younger students who are still in secondary school, who are hoping to apply for the student refugee program or other opportunities um, in the future. So it's interesting to hear that it's the same in the MENA region. I've seen recently videos posted by SRP alumni that provide instructions on how to apply, but you're right, Noor, I think that it's it's informal and it's voluntary and it's just self-driven self by the alumni themselves. And then I had one more follow-up question. You guys both mentioned 
kind of awareness and advocacy on each institution's campus and local communities. Um, can you kind of give us an idea of what that awareness, how those awareness campaigns work or what, um, what means that the campuses and the students use and local committees use to kind of um, get support behind the program and, and bring awareness to it? Every year there's some, like a list of, uh, I don't wanna say a list, but like uh, some specific campaigns that was suggest for local committees to, to do. Like for example, do something about uh, uh, refugees, uh, education for refugee girls uh, and make some awareness about the situation and how uh, it's hard for many girls in refugee camps to continue their uh, education. This is one example. The other one is about the SRP itself uh, to represent SRP students, to tell their stories, to put like a human story and face uh, to the like to the news lines. Because uh, when people know everything just from the news, there's a lot of stereotypes and a lot of stigma uh, but when people hear story from their colleagues from in the same classroom it's it's different uh, people will understand this more like in personal and human level uh, uh, so most of the campaigns we make it uh, a little bit more uh, more than discussion uh, and uh, storytelling maybe uh, sometimes maybe even a game uh, like a trivia something like this but uh, make people more engaged and curious uh, to learn more about uh, about refugees issues like around the world anything you want to add to that michelle yeah i think um so was an organization provides sort of thematic areas of of issues we want to raise awareness about, but it's really up to every campus group to decide how they go about doing that. So um, we hold, every year we hold what we call the leadership meeting in August, which brings together the leaders of each of the groups from across the campuses, across the country. And we do a three-day training where we um, identify sort of the, the the big themes of the campaigns, like Nor mentioned refugee girls education. And then we work with the different leaders to think about, okay, well, what are different activities that we could do this year on campus that would help raise awareness about that? And there's a big brainstorm um, collectively. And then those ideas sort of get shared back out um, with our network throughout the year um, for them to think about whether which ones they wanna do or whether they wanna do something else. So often, sometimes students will have participated, this is separate, but um, the, student refugee program scholars will have um, done TED talks on their campuses or they participate in panel discussions that are organized by the student groups themselves in collaboration often with other groups on campus or departments on campus. Um, they've done um, different um, like international banquets of sorts um, where they highlight the different cultures uh, of both international students, but the students that have come through the student refugee program. So it really varies from campus to campus. Um, and I guess maybe just to add to the training component. So our role as an organization is to coordinate the program, to liaise with all of our partners overseas, to liaise with all the institutions and make sure all the documentation is there and mobilize that support. But the other big piece that we, the big role that we play is in training the campus groups. So that includes the students, and the faculty and staff, but especially the student volunteers that are so actively involved. And we have different opportunities to do that throughout the year. So the August one, like I mentioned, there's a big conference that we hold in January every year in Ottawa, um, where a number of representatives from every campus come together. And again, it's an opportunity for them to receive training from us, but especially to exchange best practice practices amongst themselves and discuss challenges they're having and how to overcome them. Um, and then we have smaller regional um, meetings, what we call regional meetings, uh, because Canada is a big country like the United States. So we bring them together um, at a more local level. And so they have a chance to connect with each other. And we have cities that have many universities within them. And so um, it's an opportunity also for them to come together and collaborate potentially on a much larger citywide event, for example, like um, World Refugee Day on June 20th. So. And there's another one that just popped up, if you don't mind um, taking just a couple of minutes maybe to answer this question. Um, actually, two questions have popped up. So let us know if, if you need to run. Um, the first question was, during those local committee conventions, do you hold a separate safe space for SRP recipients themselves? And if so, how do these safe spaces feed back to improve the program as a whole, local committees more specifically? 
Uh, maybe I can answer that. Uh, uh, I know at least in the international forum, uh, there's a session, it's like a, a training, a kind of a getting feedback from a survey students, uh, where uh, former students, SRB alumni uh, have a discussion and uh, talk with SRB students who arrive at the same year. Uh, they, it's kind of a training because they tell them about the, uh, the, sorry, I forgot the word. <laughs> Uh, the, the experience and what to expect, especially after the first year, but also students will reflect on their uh, on their uh, experience. Uh, also, uh, it's not in the training, it's not in the forum, but uh, students uh, will get uh, like a forum to fill as a feedback. Uh, I think it, during the first year uh, to to communicate with uh, with WASC on the main office and tell them like uh, what kind of challenges they have. Uh, what uh, what they think that they can they wish to be improved uh, also inside local committees and uh, I see that many of the service students they have a voice uh, I don't know maybe I'm, I'm an example I'm part of the local committee and I came as a service student so uh, local committees are more engaging uh, of this RB students in the in all the decisions that uh, related to local committee Anything more there, Michelle, you'd like to add? Um, maybe to note that we have now an alumni advisory committee who provide, who, who are the ones that help deliver the, uh, the meeting that Noor was talking about. Um, but they also provide mentorship throughout the year and they've been more engaged, especially in the past year, I think because we're all learning at a distance and connecting with each other at a distance, but it's something that we will continue to do. They're, they deliver sort of or they hold, I should say, monthly webinars um, um, with the newly arrived students in their region um, to address any questions that they may have or see how they're doing. Um, there might be a special topic each time, so it really depends. And it's up to the, the alumni committee themselves to think about um, what, what sessions they'd like to hold often. Um, so that committee is made up of um, sort of 16 alumni who have come to Canada, you know, over the past 40 years. So we really have a range of individuals involved from those that arrived in the 1980s um, to those that have arrived or graduated, I should say, um, sort of within the last couple of years. Good, thanks. There's one more question, and this one has to do with the national um, the conventions. Obviously, it's not, it's not available to us now, but is there an opportunity for US students to attend? And I would even expand that to maybe um, U.S. college and university presidents and administrators who would be interested in learning more about the structure of um, SRP and WASC, maybe specifically, it is a collaboration on a more national scale here in the United States, but also just individually at each campus. Absolutely, yeah. And that international forum that Noor mentioned, which is our event in January, the best time of year to visit Canada, um, is is open to to everyone. So we have representatives, uh, we have uh, individuals join us from uh, the countries of asylum that we work in. We have a number of past students that join us, student volunteers, but we also have um, a, a vibrant network of university presidents from Canada that attend, some some of whom sit on our board of directors, um, but others who are just advocates for, um, for the program and the work that we do. And we would welcome the participation of American students anytime and American um, administrators and anyone else that you, you would like to send. And, uh, I think that's it. The chat has calmed down. Is there anything more that you two would like to add that we didn't touch upon that um, you think is important to know or just anything in general that you'd like to, to add on as kind of a summary or you know a conclusion maybe just thank thank you for having this discussion and to um for your interest in education pathways i think there's so much potential in the united states you have so many more institutions um, than we do. And if we're able to sponsor about 150 students with 100 campuses, imagine what America can do with over 3,000 campuses. Um, the impact can be so much larger than what we're having right now um, at Canadian institutions. So um, we really look forward to seeing how things develop in the United States and to supporting you along the way. And um, I think it would be great to twin our student groups and our institutional representatives at a, at a later date, maybe if that's of interest. Definitely. And, you know, the thanks is from us too, as well, for you guys uh, agreeing to take time out of your day to, you know, to talk to us today. Obviously, 
Um, in my opinion, and I think many of us who work on this project, WASC is an exemplary model and something that you know we would love to duplicate, duplic duplicate on the scale that uh, you've done in the in, in Canada. Um, so we appreciate your time, your information, and and the answers to our questions.